Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Challenger. At Challenger, we want to help you ensure that your retiree clients can meet their retirement needs today and tomorrow. To access thought leadership, insights, and tips on retirement planning for your clients, head on over to challenger.com.au forward slash XY. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and we are talking about all things to do with the changing landscape of retirement. And I'm joined by the Managing Director of Hunter Financial, Phil Smith. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, Fraser. Well, thank you for, thank you for hanging out with me and having a good chat. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself and about Hunter. Fraser, Hunter Financial started in 2004. Um, there's about 20 staff in the business and we are located in Newcastle and we look after um, clients who uh, range from, you know, in their 20s through to into their, our oldest clients um, are in their early 90s, broad range of clients. Most of our clients are time poor. They want to be well organised financially. They're not real sure who to trust. They're happy to take advice. They're happy to pay for advice. And they have a certain level of complexity in their world. And the way we operate is we meet with clients like most advisors would do. We wear the cost of the first couple of meetings just to make sure that we're the right fit for each other. And then subject to how that plays out, they'll engage, we'll provide advice, and hopefully uh, it's a long-term relationship. Yeah, fantastic. Now, this is a really interesting story. So you've got, uh, you started out the business by yourself. Did you start from scratch or was it, did you, were you? Started from scratch, yep. spot on. Started yep. from scratch. I had two other partners at the time. They've since, uh, uh, we've run out of road, so to speak. So they moved on many years ago and it's been myself and I've got uh, another shareholder which and that shareholder is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. They own a minority share in the business, and I own the balance. Yeah, fantastic! And so this is a this is an amazing growth story. Twenty staff. That's uh, quite phenomenal. Yeah, it's it's just what it is. It's been a challenge, and we need, particularly over the last, I'm going to say, uh, eighteen months, we've had to put on more staff. So probably eighteen months ago, our number of staff would probably 12 or 13 we've just had to put on more staff in the last 12 to 18 months just to deal with a lot of the governance and advice that has continued to snowball in our business particularly from a governance perspective and that's it that's just it is what it is uh, we changed licensee a bit over 12 months ago uh, so in january 2020 we changed our license which um, we, we don't have our own license. So there's a licensee involved and what came with that, um, every single client existing needed a new statement of advice. So as part of that process, we've had to gear up and we've also, we also outsource a, a fair amount of our statement of advice writing. So the, the, the 20 people on the deck in the business uh, seeing clients, giving advice and doing a lot of the work behind the scenes um, in relation to advice prep, implementation of advice and servicing our clients. We also work with, uh, there are a couple of big accounting firms that we like to work with and we do with other firms as well, uh, other accounting firms. Primarily, there's a couple of big accounting firms who like to work with us and we look after you know any advice related issues for their clients and based out of newcastle we're an hour and 45 minutes from sydney i'm down there on a semi-regular basis seeing clients and uh, our office is about 100 meters from newcastle beach it's a really nice spot and it's we're, we're busy 
put it that way. Yeah, you sounded like you're very busy. Now, tell us about how many out of that 20, because you just sort of found a new home and, and doing a lot of work in the background, producing new advice. But how many of that staff is actually advisors, client facing advisors? We have four advisors, and the rest are essentially advisor support. Uh, we also have uh, in the business, there's a mortgage broker that helps our clients and service our clients when it comes to home loans, car loans, whatever it may be. We, that's, a, that's a service that we provide to our clients as well. Yeah, fantastic. And it sounds like you work closely with the accounting firms as well. Yes, we do. We do. Uh, accountants have shied away over the last couple of years uh, with giving advice, just with the, the the change in legislation. So they still believe that their clients need advice and Many firms send us work in relation to their clients and we like working with accountants. My background is accounting. I started out as an undergraduate accountant with Price Waterhouse and then Price Waterhouse Coopers. I grew up on a wheat and cattle property northwest New South Wales and I moved to Newcastle uh, to go to university. Started out with Price Waterhouse, then Price Waterhouse Coopers, and then moved into the advice game. And I'm 41. Wow. So this is an interesting uh, part of the, you know, what's been happening with the legislation, isn't it? So there was a lot of accountants providing advice in uh, in this space, uh, especially around self of funds, I would say. And now they're sort of, they're getting out that the trend is, is that a lot of them are moving away. It's just become too hard. It's become too hard to keep up with the legislation from the accounting perspective in our game because it's 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 hard for advisors to keep up with it let alone the accountants giving advice around whether you know best interests right for the client we all act in the client's best interest naturally the accountant sometimes have a tough time to to tick all the boxes because often they want to give advice around and often it's client directed client says oh, i want to set up a self-managed super fund and the accountant says oh good idea they charge the fees, they roll over the funds and all of a sudden the client loses all their insurances because they, the accountant didn't have a conversation around insurances and the client may or not even know they had the insurances in their funds and it becomes problematic for everybody. Mm-hmm. And then the advisor gets involved to try and clean up the mess and they may not be able to clean up the mess because the client's uninsurable yep. and it becomes very, very, very problematic. And then there's other, there's war stories around accountants doing the wrong thing with the money and the legislation has changed to protect the client and unless you're a licensed financial advisor keep your mouth shut yeah yeah it's very interesting isn't it the uh when it comes around clients objectives uh, and we'll probably get a bit 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 more into this later but quite often the objectives are not necessarily just um you know uh, taking into account the the technical side they're taking into account a lot of their emotional objectives as well spot on yes now, uh, as we get into the conversation around, you know, the, the retirement landscape, uh, what's changing with it, obviously, um, you know, the, the, the big change that's coming through and, and, and we've spoken about this is the, is the baby boomer population coming into that, that space of retirement. I know you've got some ideas and thoughts on this. Do you want to, do you want to talk about uh, what you, your, your ideas around the boomers coming through? So my ideas are formed on some of the information that I read and there was a some recent studies, one study particularly that was released in February of this year by the Demographics Group um, and also ASFA. And ASFA is the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia. They've been operating since 1962. Uh, They're arguably the peak policy for research and advocacy for Australia's superannuation system um, and the industry itself. The... It was also sponsored by Challenger. I think Challenger are a market leader when it comes to this retirement space, particularly with some of the work they do around annuities. Anyway, the white paper was rethinking retirement, the impact of demographic change and the pandemic on retirement planning in the 2020s. So this particular white paper released in February 2021 speaks about and did some research around baby boomers And on the back of the baby boomers uh, talks about the baby bust. And so my thinking is based on a lot of this 
research and what I read, and essentially the baby bust of the 2020s will be one of the biggest demographic issues impacting Australia in 80 years, as the research would suggest. And the other, there, there are three of these biggest issues. The other two were women returning to the workforce in the 70s, and the second was the baby boom of the 50s. And essentially, baby bust is said to follow a baby boom by 70 years. So it occurs when more workers exit the workforce at age 65 than those that enter the workforce at age 15. And therefore, Australia has, by definition, has been on a baby bus trajectory for decades. So I like that type of research and thinking because in the retirement planning space, we've got this, what the demographers refer to as a baby bus. And back in the 20s, the research shows that there were so the number of people entering the so-called retirement age of 65 and over has ramped up over time. And in the 1990s, for example, the Australia's 65 and over population increased by an average of around 40,000 per year. In the 2020s, it will peak at 137,000 per year. It gives us an indication of this bell curve of retirees who will be retiring and then the baby bust that eventually happens. And this surge in the retiree population is caused, of course, by the great baby boom of the 50s. The impact that this has in the retirement landscape has a multitude of impacts, particularly around things like longevity risk, which is essentially the risk that your money will run out before you do, essentially. And there are product providers in the marketplace like Challenger that can provide help to advisors like myself and maybe some of your listeners to help achieve the goals of these retirees. And they're, they're, they are also a different type of retiree than they were years ago. Yeah, so this is going to be really interesting, isn't it? Because uh, the 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 needs of these retirees. Well, I guess I guess let's say, and I think the comment previously has been that the, the baby boomers have always done things differently uh, as they're coming through, and so. What, what you know, planning for a retirement now for somebody, uh, we need to start thinking about what the future is going to look like rather than just thinking about what it is today. Absolutely. So the baby boomers will be the first generation of retirees, this is interesting, who I believe will have a memory of their parents in retirement. So some of the de- demographers have done the study and have shown that previous generations of retirees have no real experience with long-term aging because their parents died in their 60s, based on some of the stats. The parents of the baby boomers lived on and into their 80s and their 90s. And there's actually a photographic record of their time in retirement. So we've got these baby boomers coming through who are helping their parents through retirement and into aged care. And we've got this wave of baby boomers coming through that very likely they'll they have a greater use of technology and they are arguably more educated and they are arguably more sophisticated so the they do their own research they understand some of the some of the issues that affect their behaviors when it comes to investing and managing money, um, which I'd like to, if it's okay with you, have a chat about that during the course of this conversation. And also these retirees, therefore, when they seek advice, often they want to be either self-directed or they come with their own agenda when it comes to managing their own money and managing the decisions that they ultimately need to make. Yeah, so it sounds like... um, uh what you're saying to me is that a lot of the time their expectations are very different from the, the previous generations of retirees where it was it was more around, um, you know, a shorter retirement lifespan 
Uh, but now the expectation is that, and, and you're right about the technology part, and, and I hadn't really thought about the, the the photography part as well. There there are a lot of photographs being um, taken and remembered and, and hosted on sites where they can often see them. Absolutely. And not only will they be very aware of the ageing process of their parents, there's this acute awareness of their own mortality and equally as how they're going to ensure that they have the type of life and lifestyle that they want to live whilst making sure that things like aged care and I mentioned before longevity risk, making sure their money's invested in such a way that they will know, not think, know that they're going to have enough money week in, week out, month in, month out for the rest of their life. And these problems need solutions and th- this is a this is a real issue that the industry and Australia as a whole is coming to grips with and it's arriving. Mm. And the baby bus is a real thing and there's this larger group than any that we've ever had before that will be not working without going into the issue around the baby bust and the taxes that they therefore are not paying and what that has on Australia as, a, as, a, as, as an economy. The issue fundamentally is we've got a, a larger percentage of our population not working and therefore not paying taxes and needing to live the life that they want to live and it won't be new to them because they've just helped their own parents through this process themselves and they will be acutely aware as to how to hopefully how to deal with it and they'll be seeking advice on how to do it. So I really think this uh, particular market around aged care and retirement planning is going to continue to grow and become more complicated and which is why advisors need to really step up to the plate and have these types of conversations with clients before it's it gets to a stage where it's hard to plan for. Yeah, it seems to me, uh, I think the key is obviously planning, but it seems to me that if, if somebody's seen their parents go through the aged care process, if you like, let's call it a process, I hate that word, but but let's go with it for now. Uh, if they've seen their parents go through that, that, uh, that, that process, then they're more likely to plan their own way through that process? Yes, they will. Uh, Bernard Sol, who I like, he's a demographer and he was a contributor to the study that I alluded to before that came out in February 2021. He talks about how mistakes will be made by governments and also retirees. Uh, he alludes to the fact that we, as a, as a country, will be required throughout this decade to continue the goodwill for our elderly and that there's an appreciation within the society that there has been no other time in history has there been this type of position that the country's been placed in to care for such a large proportion of its population as there will be over the coming decade. He also refers to this baby bus and this generation that we're talking about. They are fitter than previous generations. The baby boomers are interested in wellness. They stopped smoking decades ago. They watch what they drink. Some will want to work on not wishing to be a burden, but they'll also want to work on for the purpose of leaving a legacy of sorts. So there's a myriad of complexity when it comes to this type of conversation and there's no right or wrong, Fraser. I just, I the, the, the best part and the best path to take is just to have the conversation and create awareness for our clients and society at large to deal with it. Yeah. Now we, I'm going to ask some questions about that, uh, that those conversations in a second. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to quickly go back to this, the bust, the word bust, because to me there's sort of there's two parts to this. There's the the uh, the system itself, and is that on a is that on a um, trajectory to bust? And then there's the individual, you know, going bust, running out of money, um, in that those sorts of things. So uh, are they referring to more the individual running out of money from longevity risk, or are they referring to the system being under so much pressure that it's, that something's going to have to change? 
I think it's just as simple as, without overthinking it, Fraser, I think it's just as simple as the baby boom. And by definition, they, as we all do, must die. And those baby boomers will die. And essentially, I don't think it's a baby bust in the terms of, in the sense of the economy, nor nor the, the individuals and their own wealth, but just in the course of a lifetime, the, the you know current life expectancy rates for these individuals is early 80s. So they're coming into their 70s and therefore over the next decade, okay, there's this baby bust, i.e. they've retired or they are retiring and they will ultimately need advice and help around this situation that they'll be faced with, whether it be retirement or aged care. And it's a demographer term of a baby bust as opposed to necessarily what I believe an economic reference. Yeah, fair enough. So there'll be also um, a a huge wealth transfer conversations or a a lot of people looking at legacy and wealth transfer. Yeah, that's a big piece of the puzzle. The estate planning, who does the money go to, what are the taxation implications in most advice practices that I'm aware of, advisors are having conversations not not only with their clients who may have the wealth, i.e. the baby boomers in this particular context, they also need to be having a conversation with the beneficiaries of that estate because that wealth transfer that you referenced, you could lose clients Mm. because you're looking after money, for example, and giving advice to these clients, they pass away, all of a sudden you're dealing with the beneficiaries whom you've never met. Um, And that's another conversation for another podcast around these Gen X, Gen Y style investors because when they receive that money, they are a different type of investor and a different type of client than their parents. Yeah, it certainly seems that uh, planners need to be really thinking about how to have conversations with those that next generation. I think it's our duty to just to have the conversation. We're not, you're not having the conversation to go into problem solving mode and thinking that you have a solution. It's just, hey, by the way, as the years go by, these are some of the things that we see happen with some of our other clients. Um, just want to create some awareness around this for you. Clients generally then say, yeah, yeah, we've been thinking about this. What do you think? And then we have a conversation around it. Often it's a good opportunity to, to provide some advice. We do some cash flows around longevity risk. Again, making sure that their money doesn't run out before they do. And we want to ensure that they can continue to achieve their goals. And then you can put together strategies to ensure that the options that they'll be facing as the years go by can be factored in to the overall plan. Yep. Now, the planning obviously involves a lot of technical conversation and and strategic planning. Uh, But of course, that doesn't always work. People are going through a process that's quite emotional and emotive in many ways. And a lot of the decisions that they make during that process if they weren't sitting in with you in front of you talking about the uh, the technical side and making sure that the numbers work can can be a, uh, they can make unusual decisions let's put it that way <laughs> yes they can and i laugh because it's funny people make these irrational decisions and it's not who they are and and then as time goes by we reflect on some of the decisions that were made and often the conversation goes a little bit like this. Mr. and Mrs. Klein, remember we had this conversation 12 months ago. This is what we advise that you do. You were very not receptive to the advice at the time because at the time you were concerned about COVID-19, markets crashing, you want to take the money out and put it into cash. And as a result of that, uh, you would have missed out on the recovery since March. Um, are you happy with the decisions that we made at the time? Client's response is, oh, Phil, I don't even know what I was thinking. I'm really sorry that we, you know, we thought about taking all that money out, putting in the cash and fixed interest. It's a lot of this media hype. So the, the irrational thinking is common when there are these significant events. And it's hard to be logical with someone who's being irrational. Now, when people are 
thinking irrationally, it could be significant health events, it could be significant market events that make them think that way. Part of our role as the advisor is to recognise that thinking, that behavioural bias that they may be feeling and create awareness around it, have a discussion around it and give the advice that's in the client's best interest. So we saw that with uh, COVID-19 and the market volatility uh, in early 2020 and we see it with clients when they're dealing with other emotional stress. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to pick up on the term irrational here because I think it's a certainly a, a really interesting part of the conversation because I, I think it's irrational or irrational only really happens in afterthought or from a, a sec, or a third chair perspective. You know, like I think people are always in their own heads are being rational even when their behaviour is irrational. I agree with you and it's the hindsight to your point that we can look at it and go, you know what, yeah, you're right. Thank you that I received that advice at the time. Whether we're talking about mental health, okay, so people, it's been the studies have shown that when people are in the groups of depression, okay, they are they feel that the decisions they are making are the right decisions for them. And as hopefully as time goes by, they look back and they go, "What was I thinking?" Okay, at the time though, what they were thinking and the decisions that they're making, they believed were right for them and I to, to the context of managing money and making financial decisions for people and their lives and their families part of our role as advisors and it's not just in relation to managing money uh, it's it's also in relation to just to managing decisions that involve money uh, often it's not managing the money it's in relation to whether they want to borrow money to buy a property whether it's wanting to change goals that have already been set whether it's in relation to changing how they live changing their retirement goal it's it's we need to be very very aware acutely aware of the goal setting process which in our business uh like a lot of good advisors i think they are goals based advisors which essentially when you get to the bottom of goal-based advice is just we have a conversation with our clients, we work out what their goals are, we then put a plan in place to ensure that those goals are achieved. And then we, for example, a client wants to retire in 10 years' time, we say, okay, that's 120 months away, we work out what we need to do each and every month for the next 120 months from today to get them to where they need to be. So part of the goals-based advice process is we need to capture that information and we need to make sure that we often protect our clients from themselves when, not if, when they have times in their life that make them question the course that they're on, particularly if there's an external stimuli being a health event or another very serious event could be um, a geopolitical risk with markets, could be COVID-19, could be COVID-20, could be anything. That's yeah. our role. Yeah, you're certainly right. If somebody hasn't got something to focus on, then uh, then those uh, you know e- external factors could be as little as the Uber driver's comments. But um, uh, you also <laughs> you've also mentioned uh, you know the clients um, being able to see in hindsight of um, you know events and, and those sorts of things, and to be able to see the value that you provide as a as a planner in hindsight. But I think it's also a lot of it is what you're doing is is looking at that foresight um, conversation, isn't it? It's providing clarity around what could happen what will happen in that space. And uh, and I'm also going to tackle the goals-based advice question separately, but I, I love the goals-based advice part. But a lot of what you're doing in that planning process with clients is, is then focusing not on the past, but on the on the future. Yes, and I, I don't think I would be in business and doing what I'm doing unless I believe that my future is bigger than my past. And I like to have that type of conversation with our clients. We want to make sure that where they are headed, that what they need to achieve, we can help them achieve that. And if the the trajectory that they're on, if they're not going to make it, then we need to change course to make sure they get to where they want to get to. And that's our role with the advice that we give. In, in summary, I think what we do for our clients, if I can 
when I'm doing a lot of flying of late, the picture of a plane, you turn up to the airport and there are two planes. Uh, one plane has a pilot on it, the other plane doesn't. You'd probably want to get on the plane with a pilot. We would consider ourselves, in this case, the pilot. Our role is essentially to make sure that we take off on time and land on time and get there safely. That's essentially all we do. We, we make sure they take off on time, land on time, get there safely. And of course, there's going to be issues with the weather, turbulence, the in-flight entertainment may not work, the chicken comes out cold, whatever it may be, someone's kicking your seat from behind. I mean, all these sorts of things happen, but our role, we'll make sure that you land on time and make sure that you get there safely. And these types of situations that may arise during the flight, well, we're okay with it, but we don't want you to jump out of the plane and eject. We don't want you to, you know, we've all got parachutes. That's what we, that's part of our role with insurances and our advice that we give around other strategies to, to protect the downside. So we, we, we help as well. Essentially, though, the looking forward as opposed to back is what our role is as advisors and planners. And we want to make sure that we have a relationship with our clients that they can actually call us and talk to us on a regular basis to make sure that we're we're across their situation both personally and financially yeah i love the uh the the, the pilot analogy um i think uh, you know the stats are something like uh 93 of the time a flight is actually off uh, you know like it's had to change its 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 route as, as it's going along and uh, you know winds come along and so 93 percent of the time it's, it's it's not on track, but it still gets to the to the to the end. I spoke to a pilot once, and uh, they said that taking off is um, optional and landing is essential. So that's certainly part of uh, what's going to happen. That's good. Um, now, now tell me about goals based advice because um, I, I, you know a lot of what you do is you, you as you said, uh, um, sitting down, finding out what your clients' hopes, dreams, goals, aspirations are, and it definitely fits within the within the con context of um, knowing what their motivations are knowing what their values are um, helps them with that managing or managing the decisions that they make part of it how do you go about that goals based advice piece with your clients so we i listened to your there was another guest that you had on a couple of months ago now and he he nailed it Um, those guys are good operators when it comes to goals based advice bill Bacharach um, from the us literally wrote the book on values-based advice. So values-based advice, to be a little bit off-center to goals-based advice, values-based advice is we wanna make sure that we understand what our clients' values are. Think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we wanna make sure that the goals that we are setting for our clients, and, and more importantly, that they are helping us to help them set those goals, uh, we want to make sure that we never waver from their values. Uh, to some clients, once you go through the, the process, you know, we might say, so if, you, if you're in this position and this goal is being achieved, how would you feel? And they would, some answers will be, I'll, I'll feel like I've been the best father that I could be and the best husband that I could have been. I felt like I would have been able to leave a legacy for my family if I could achieve that goal. So, so so we use that juice to make sure that we remind our clients why they are on this journey. Not It's not just to be able to put their kids through the right education. It's not just about paying off their home by the time they're 50. It's not just about being able to retire when they're 60 on $1,500 a week. It's not just about um, going on a holiday every year for $15,000. It's what is important about achieving those goals and, and, and whatever the answer is, that's the juice that I like because I want to remind them down the track when they ring me and say, Phil, I'm thinking about buying an investment property, what do you think? When we go, oh, my answer is I don't know, but let me have a look at the numbers. And I go, you can do that, but it means that these other things may not be able to be achieved. What do you want to do? I go, no, no, it's really important that I continue to send my kids to this school. It's really important that I don't work past 60. I want to stop work at 60. But if I buy the investment property, it means that I may retire at 63. So we want to make sure that not only are the financial goals set, we also want to make sure that what is important about those goals being achieved for them 
And then I'll ask them a question at the end of the process. Say, if, if this is often before they engage us, Fraser, um, I'll say, if we can help you achieve these outcomes, is that the type of advice firm that you'd want to be working with? And they always say yes. And that just helps me help them get some clarity around what our role is. Our role is not to get a better return on one fund over another. Our role is not to have a fund that pay that charges the client less than another fund. You can you can do you, anybody can do that, right? Our role is more around accountability and around making sure that they, as you say, it's essential to land. We want to make sure that we land and we land on time. Yeah. Now uh, I agree, I 100 agree, and I often say that the conversation around values is, you know, how do you know? Uh, if you're providing value, if your advice is providing value to the client, if you don't know what their values are uh, and you hit the nail on the head when you talked about the concept of, you know, the values equals your why um, and their, their motivation, their juice uh, for doing what they're going to do and, and, and staying and making the right decisions. You mentioned fees in that conversation as well and the, and the race to the, what I see with the regards to the race to the bottom uh, when it comes to comparing, you know, and, and what's important is it high returns and low fees, high returns and low fees being the, the thing that is, is, is sort of pushed out from the, you know, let's say the media, but let's say the industry does it as well and the profession does it as well. They talk about, you know, high returns and low fees a lot um, and, and, and that has nothing to do with the client's values. Very interesting conversation. Just briefly again, and I'm sorry to go back to the to the airplane situation um, analogy, but people can choose how they want to travel. Um, they all take off at the same time. They also land at the same time. They all get there safely. Uh, some people are flying first class. Some are business. Some are economy. It just it just depends on what they want their experience to be. And so when it comes to fees. Uh, and performance, I think it's a it's an excellent conversation for the industry to be having. And I, I it's 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 horses for courses when it comes to the client experience and how their money should be invested. And if we're talking about superannuation as an example, there's been you know the My Super initiative, which I think is excellent. Um, there's been a lot more conversation around that of late recently. Xavier O'Halloran who's the director of Super Consumers Australia, uh, spoke to some people and I read it in an article recently that the average fee is 1.04%. That was up to the December quarter, according to the Prudential Regulator. So they're suggesting, he has suggested that, to quote him, so a good rule of thumb for people is to look for less than 1% in fees. I, I really think that we need to have a more robust conversation with our clients, not just about performance, not just about fees, more around what it is that they are looking for. And again, another conversation for another day, this conversation around ESG investing, so environmental social governance investing, you know, uh, something might refer to that as ethical investing. Um, some of those funds may ch- charge higher than that, but if, it, if a client's got 100000 or 50000 or a million dollars, whatever it may be, and it's their money, well, they should choose how that should be managed. And particularly if they believe that they would want to make a difference and want to have that money in the hands of more ESG style companies, well, then that's their choice. And that, that gets away a little bit from the, the cost and performance of funds. There's, there's also the talk of uh, from July 1 this year, it's proposed that all Australians will have access to a new Your Super website, which will allow them to easily compare all funds' performance and the tax office is working on prototypes of how we'll display the data. And the word is that that'll, that deadline will be delivered by July 1. The point to that is advisors need to be having deeper conversations with clients, not just about performance and costs, because people can go and get that information easily. Go back to this, the baby bus conversation and, and the demographers' research around how that's going to work. They are very, they've got time on their hands, okay, and they are well-versed generally with technology and they will do their own research. 
So it's going to be a pretty quick conversation if you're only going to have a conversation around cost versus performance. I'm not suggesting that advisors are only having that conversation, but from the legislator's perspective, I feel sometimes they think the only answer and the best advice is if you can have a fund that has the lowest cost, then it's in the client's best interest. Or sometimes the client doesn't know what their best interests are unless you actually have a deep conversation with them around their values which is aligned to their goals. And it's an old phrase, any how is possible as long as you know the why. And it's our role to make sure that we align the two. Yeah, well, I like that saying, any how is possible as long as you align the why. Um, as, as long as you know the why. Know the why. Uh, so, yeah, well, as you, as you were saying that, um, uh, I was sort of thinking of, you know, you mentioned the the, the airline again. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was thinking also, um, you know, with regards to that, you know, that, that fee fee versus, you know, um, return, et cetera, et cetera. It, and you're right, it's going to be very easy for technology to show what they've been in the past, obviously, but, you know, that's, again, hindsight. Um, but also, you know, there, there, are, there, are other, there are many other industries that do this, right? You know, the, the cheapest way to buy food is probably the supermarket, um, but yet we still go to a cafe and, and, you know, you know, buy a coffee or or buy uh, buy some food that's been prepared for us. Um, even though technically we can get a better value for money if you like if we made it ourselves. That is right. It's 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 about I think it's about the experience and it's about believing that we as advisors as a you know, as an industry as a profession that we can actually add value. And if you cannot add value, then we need to question the relationship with the client. And it's not just value in terms of dollars, Fraser. I think Einstein said it best when he said, the things that count can't be counted. It's not just about the money. It's not just about we've made you X percent and you in your other fund, you would have made Y percent. It's about achieving the goals. It's about having a professional relationship. It's about protecting the client's best interest, enhancing their position financially. It's around making sure that they have this level of certainty, um, peace of mind, potentially. It's around making sure that they have the level of care that's required in any profession to make sure that they get to where they want to get to and they don't have the stress and anxiety that they otherwise would have if they were trying to do it themselves. Now, the result, by the way, may be the same. The result may be the same or from a fee perspective, they actually may be worse off from a fee perspective, i.e. the advice fee that they pay us. Forget the cost of the the, the product fees, you know, the performance and cost within the actual, you know, fund, if we're talking about funds, they may not need to pay a, an advice fee. And it may be essentially that our advice that we charge over the course of X years they would have ended up in the same spot. But it's nice to have the certainty year in, year out, year in, year out that you're on track, you're going to achieve those goals and you can go on the holiday, you can do the things you want to do, you can do the renovations of the house, you can put the deck on, you can salary sacrifice, do all the things you want to do and you're going to get there and you're going to be okay. If they didn't have that advice, they could be, in a lot of cases, anxious and stressed, lacking certainty, around what they should be doing, where they're going to get to and what are they going to do if they get there and they've run out of time to change the position that they've landed on. And I think that conversation also needs to be had. I mean, we, we have that with our clients to make sure that they know that, you know, they're in safe hands, the advice is sound and you're on track. And part of our advice is to make sure that they stay on track. Yep. And you know, we like it, we see value in it, clients see value in it. And you know, what if they don't see value in it? We have a conversation around it and they are no longer clients. That's rare, but they're, that they're okay to choose not to re-engage. And we re-engage with our clients every single year. Yep. So as you were saying that, I'm, I'm imagining you can change the word advice fee or advisor fee with the uh, removal of stress and anxiety fee or the providing certainty fee. <laughs> You, you, you could, you, you could. Um, I don't know what, from a compliance and governance perspective, how that would go about. We, we don't have a, 
I just, I'm so passionate about what we do and I see so much value in what we do for our clients. I just, that I want to help as many people as I can. And I think that our industry and our profession are in such a great position to help as many people as we can. We just need to shift the focus from talking about product because that's never been the game. The game is always around the client and their best interests and what is what is it that we can do to add value. And some, some advisors are, uh, are good at problem, being problem solvers. I, I think the, the unique advisor is a, an advisor who uh, is a problem finder and they can they can see those blind spots for the client they create awareness around it they therefore create a solution around it as well and the client goes I never even knew that that was a thing and yeah it's a real thing and we're going to solve it for you and it's great it's great and I think the type of advice that we want to give moving forward as a profession is around the continued value proposition being helping the client and making sure that we are uh, always adding value and acting in their best interests, even if the advice is just keep doing what you are doing. Just keep doing what you are doing and people will pay for that. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I like the problem finder conversation. I think that you know asking those deeper questions and going deeper into those conversations uh, and finding the issues that are underlying that may not necessarily be on the surface that are, that are there anyway that you can solve is, is, a, is a great thing for advisors to be focusing on. The other thing to add to that, it's really easy these days to, you, you could Google your own, a client can Google their own problem and the solution will come up and you, you jump on the websites and they go, oh, this is great. I guess the point is some of those self-directed clients, they, they need advice on other areas of their advice, not just the things they know they need advice on. Great, we can handle that as well. What you really need to be having a deep dive into uh, are things around longevity risk, their risk profiles, making sure they're invested the right way, taxes, whether it be, you know, to throw a technical term in there or a strategy around recontribution strategies to making sure that their estate plays the minimum amount of tax upon death. I mean, all these types of things, people like Centlink, people don't want to deal with Centlink because they're so difficult to deal with. We provide that service in-house. It's just thank you for taking that stress away from me and we just deal with it and we, and we do it. This is the trick. We do it with a smile on our face. It's just we love to do it. And some things, Fraser, you just can't fake, okay? So you need to, I think, the firm of the future, and there's a good, um, there's Harvard, the Harvard Business Review released uh, uh, an article recently, and it was um, referred to as what professional service firms must do to thrive. And it's an absolute cracking white paper. and. It's almost like it was written for me. It was written in such a way that I was like, this is me. This is what we do and this is what we need to do to thrive over the next decade. What professional service firms must do to thrive. It's an absolutely cracking article. Um, and the one of the key takeaways there for me are making sure that the clients that you are working with are clients that your staff also want to work with because as their complexity grows, the client's complexity grows, your staff are continuing to be energised and engaged and they continue to grow, which in line grows the firm, in line grows more complexity, um, problem solving and problem finding abilities and ultimately as time goes by, it's self-perpetuating and you attract more and more of those clients which keeps your staff happy and the snowball effect continues. Yeah, fantastic. So what are some of the things that you're working on in, in the future to to become the firm of the future over the next decade? <laughs> there are so many balls in the air. Um, so we're dealing with all of our advisors um, are going through all the the phasia exams and modules and studies. So we've all done that now. Um, so that's been uh, one box ticked. There's been a big rollout in our firm in the last 12 months and more so over the next 12 months with our capacity to deliver advice. Um, so these statements of advice that we provide to our clients 
We are wanting to do them more efficiently, more effectively, and provide more value to our clients. And we're relying on IT for that. So we've we've developed and we and we outsource some of the some of the human resource word processing element. We outsource some of that. So there's IT with the delivery of advice documents and our capacity to do more. And we are ensuring that our engagement process with our clients is seamless and energizing for our clients. And we're also probably thirdly, making sure that that customer experience, that client experience across the board is second to none. We really wanna make sure that our clients are just thriving on the advice that we give them and our, my, my mindset in my business is we, move, we need to move from, so our, our staff, we need to move from this idea of client retention and the mindset is and has been for years, it, it is client advocacy. So it's, such, it's just not about doing what needs to be done to retain the client. That's just a ticket to the game. That is just a ticket to the game where you where you really need to play and the mindset needs to be is around client advocacy. So we ask our clients for introductions, uh, the, the you know, or, or referrals. I don't use the word referral, I talk about introductions. Um, and the reason I talk about introductions as opposed to referrals is because our clients don't really understand what referrals. If I want to introduce, if I want to meet Fraser Jack at a cafe, I wouldn't say to my friend, can you go and refer me to Fraser Jack? I'd just say, can you introduce me to Fraser Jack, please? And they go, yeah, of course, he's over here. The, the terminology just needs to change. Um, so it's a our business, I think, runs very smoothly and the processes that have been implemented ensure where possible that this client advocacy mindset is ingrained in all of our staff so we're doing more for our clients and with the view that they'll be happy and see value and introduce friends and family to us but if we're just doing what we did last year their expectations will be the same. We want to build and exceed those expectations. And if we do what we just did last year, which may be a high bar, Fraser, by the way, still may be a high bar, but if we're just doing what we did last year, they will just be not impressed. Unfortunately, that's the way the, the brain works. Yeah, wow. I love I love the mindset uh, that goes along with that and, and the culture that you're building there in the business around that, you know, continual improvement and, and, and putting yourself in the client's you know, shoes and working out what sort of things is going through their mind and and uh, and helping them along the way. So, th- thank you very much, Phil, for coming in and chatting to us today. Really appreciate your insights. Now, tell us if somebody wants to continue the conversation, what's the best way for them to get hold of you? If they wanted to get hold of me, they can send me an email. Uh, my email address is p smith at hunterfinancial dot com. So P for Phil, P Smith at hunterfinancial.com.au or they could call me at the office, which is 0249434876. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Phil. Really appreciate your insights uh, and uh, all all things regarding the changing landscape of retirement, but also a lot of little uh, great little tips on running a financial planning practice. Appreciate it. Thank you, Fraser. Well, there you have it, another episode of the XY Advisor Podcast. And I'm Fraser Jack, of course, and I'm joined by Emily Blanche. G'day, Emily. Hey, Fraser. How are you? I'm tremendous. Thank you for asking. And, of course, it's time for our best part of the week where we do some shout-outs to XY members. Absolutely. All right. Today, I want to give a big shout-out to XY Advisor Declan Thomas. He is a holistic advisor over on the west side of Australia And he's one of our top members over the last little while. He's been actively jumping into discussions, adding plenty of value to comments, answering advisors' questions, even adding some of his own thought-provoking questions onto those discussions. And he's just been an absolute champion. So a community is really as good as those that get involved and participate. And Declan's really just 
been a team player, which has been amazing. So I wanted to give a shout out to you. Love your work, Declan. It doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you for your contribution. It's definitely helping drive the positive evolution of financial advice.